The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of ONTV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Welcome into Views from the Sidelines. We're already into April. It's April 6th. I'm your host, Joey Tysik, my partner, Malik Hill. And college basketball season is over officially. We have a national champion. We went through the Final Four, had some good games, actually. So we'll talk about that. Um, we got to catch up on the NBA. They're about to get into the playoffs pretty soon here. Some uh, key teams are out, some key teams are in. And if we have time, we'll start to talk about the NFL draft just a little bit, but we'll have to wait and see how much time we have left because there's a lot of NBA updates that we got to go through. But anyway, Malik, how did you enjoy the Final Four slash National Championship? Uh, I I watched it in my living room uh, with my stepdad, just the two of us having good father-son bonding time, enjoying basketball together. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, the Final Four, not the National Championship. I watched the championship. <laughs> it was so late. I I figured I'd fall asleep, I'll fall asleep at some point, so I just watched it in my bed. Yeah. But the Duke Carolina game was an absolute classic. Mm-hmm. Down to the final shot by Caleb Love. It was just back and forth. Palo, Palo, Paolo mm-hmm. hitting big shots. Different guys making big plays. That was a great game. Villanova, they were in it. Yeah. Kansas got out hot on them. Villanova came back. Colin Gillespie hit some big shots. But in the end, not having Justin Moore pretty much killed them. Right. They didn't have a guy that can get them buckets in the last few minutes. And Kansas finished it out. I predicted North Carolina would win the national championship. Mm-hmm. And in the first half, it looked like they were uh, well on their way to doing it. Yep, until they had a historic downfall. Yeah, um, some would say a choke. Others would say... I don't know. They, they they just lost momentum. They just stopped hitting shots. Mm-hmm. However you want to say it, they fell apart. Yep. North Carolina went into halftime up 40 to 25. It looked like Kansas had no answers. It looked like they had lost all their juice and they had run out of gas. And they stepped on the gas pedal in the second half mm-hmm. and got out to a 30 to 10 run. Yeah. In like the first six minutes of the second half. Mm-hmm. And everything just turned around. Yeah, and unfortunately for UNC, uh, the whole one of the big reasons they got there was their guards, Caleb Love, R.J. Davis. One of the reasons they lost the national championship was R.J. Davis and Caleb Love. Yeah. Both shot tremendously awful. Um, UNC as a team shot really bad, which goes back to my point from last week of that for some reason in this tournament there had been some very poor offensive numbers on some nights. Not always, but... I felt like more than normal, there was a lot of games where teams really struggled to score, which can be rough to watch at times. Um, But luckily, because Kansas making the big comeback, uh, and then it stayed close in the final minutes that, you know, it was exciting enough. Um, But I'm sure there's not too many people that are happy that Kansas won. Because obviously, there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that, you know, they've been called out for. Even beyond that, I've never met a Kansas fan in my life. You I've, met I've, me. I've never. You're not so. Grow, as a kid, I used to be a big Kansas fan. I swear, this is something you have never told me. Probably not. Do you? Are you keeping more secrets? So I used to because I used to um, pick Kansas all the time in the tournaments. Big Kirk Heinrich fan. Yeah, barely. Mario Chalmers. Jeff Withy. Oh boy, Jeff Withy. Listen, Michigan, Cole Aldrich. Michigan put Withy out, so. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, Cole Aldrich and them, they, they're they pretty good. So, and the reason for that is I used to have one of those uh, Kansas pullover starter jackets every 90s kid had. So that was like the main reason that I was a fan of them. Um, I just like the Jayhawk logo. I've always been a big fan. Like my favorite color has been blue. So it's just 
one of those things as a kid you gravitate towards. Um, so yeah, I, I I I'm not as much of a Kansas fan as I used to be, of course, but yeah, one of my teams growing up. You swindled us. It's funny, I'm just not finding this out. <laughs> but I can't yeah. give all my secrets away. <laughs> they're they're one of those schools that most of the people I've known that watch basketball and know basketball just they're they're not fans of Kansas. Mm-hmm. Whenever they have star players, they're usually gone after like a year or two. People, I, I, I don't know why, it seems like people don't like, have never liked Bill Self that much. Yeah. Either because of like who he is as a person or like you said, the allegations and stuff he's done that the NCAA probably knows about but just has let go. Right. Because they're Kansas. Yeah, several reasons, but Kansas has never been a favorite mm-hmm. of most college basketball fans. Right. Yeah, so I mean, again, we talked about it last week. Like the final four teams were a lot of teams that people don't really like. Uh, Duke being just that team that's always there, people don't like that. UNC, another one of those teams that's always there, don't like that. Kansas, allegations, whatnot, and then Villanova. Like, I'm I'm assuming that there's a lot of people around this area that don't like Villanova because Villanova has been the one to knock off Michigan's big run. Yes, um, <laughs> in recent memory. So I don't personally hate Villanova. I like Jay Wright and what he's built. But, right. Uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So, overall, solid tournament. We kind of recapped it a little bit last week. We didn't say the final score. <laughs> uh, I don't remember. <laughs> 72. 72 to 67. To 69. 69. Nice. 72 to 69, Kansas. Kansas wins. Yeah. Remy Martin hits big shots. Yeah, he went pretty nuclear towards yeah. the end. His, he has a weird jumper. He barely jumps. Mm-hmm. It's almost all arms. Yeah. But it goes in. And mm-hmm. he's super quick. Yeah. Moves around a lot. Christian Brown had a big second half too. Oche Baji wasn't nope. really big there. He didn't do a ton throughout the whole time. He tournament. hit the first three of the game. Yeah. He had he had some really good games yeah. in there. But yeah, Christian Brown came up big. David McCormick finished out the game strong. Mm-hmm. He hit the shot to officially win it and Kansas wins another championship. Yep. We'll see how long they can keep this one. Yeah. We'll, we'll we have to wait and see. see. Um, so now it's going to be interesting now. We have a lot of off season for NCAA, which is now more interesting these days um, with the transfer portal. And the one thing I did want to bring up is the top three guards from St. Peter's Peacocks all entered the transfer portal. This is so one. we will not see a return of the St. Peter's Peacocks. Once Shaheen Holloway left. Yeah, it, the, the writing was on the wall. I, also, I, this isn't like Florida Gulf Coast where, like, for the next two or three years, people were still, like, waiting for Dunk City to come back. And they got back to the tournament once. Yeah. Played Florida State strong. But, yeah, they ended up falling off. Yeah. I have a question before we move on. Okay. Hubert Davis, you agree he got severely outcoached in the second half of that game? You agree by Bill Self? Um... Or at least just he he got out coached. I think to a, his decision making wasn't very good. I think to a degree. Um, you got to get Brady Manick a jump a, a jumper. Yeah, probably w- one. That's one definitely one of the downfalls. But at the same time, like I understand your point of like Caleb Love and R.J. Davis shot bad, but at the same time, like Caleb Love hit a huge shot against Duke. Um, so just live by the dunk, live by the gun, die by the gun at this, yeah, at this point. Is that, that's kind of my thought. It's like you're in the national championship. You try to just keep doing what got you, doing what helped get you there. Um, but I do agree that they probably needed to involve Manic a bit more. So my question is, do the how, – how do I phrase this? How high should expectations be raised for Hubert Davis? Because I feel like this run wasn't expected after the season they had. That win at Duke put them into the position they are. They got into through all throughout the tournament. They found their confidence again. Yeah. Now the recruiting expectations are going to be back up high. Yeah. They're probably going to be ranked preseason top 10, mm-hmm. maybe top five, because they could bring back like four out of the five in the starting five. Yeah. Plus Puff Johnson. But I don't. Do you, I don't know if that's a good, like, great. But or do bad you name, think but. four of the five are going to come back? I don't know if Caleb Love or R.J. Davis leave. I don't think their stocks are going to be high. I think Caleb Love. Armando Baycott is probably gone. Yeah, 
I mean, Manic can't play another year of college. True, I forgot about that. <laughs> I think Leaky Black has an extra year. Mm. He's not getting drafted. No. So why would he leave? I just they're bringing back most of the roster. I guess I have a slight concern about is Caleb Love a junior? Yes, him and R.J. Davis. Yeah, maybe he comes back one more year. I, his stock is isn't necessarily high after this tournament run because of, like, because he was either great or bad. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But do you think the expectations for Hubert Davis are going to grow through the roof because oh, yeah. of this surprise run? Oh yeah, I, th- I think they're. And can he live up to it? Yeah, I, I think they're definitely going to. Um, but I would predicate that on depending on how many people stay, because if like R.J. Davis or Caleb Love leave, it's going to make it a lot harder. Because like you said, basically Baycott and Manic are probably gone. And yes, it's UNC. They're going to get top recruits. But I don't know if we've fully seen this UNC staff with a full recruitment class of how they'll attack that. So I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, the, the class they have coming in now is, I think, top 10. But you have no idea. Recruits can bust. Yeah. So they live up to the you, – you never know. But I do think there is some – elevation to expectations for sure that unc is kind of getting back on track and this tournament run was definitely the spark for yeah they also only had like a six or seven man rotation at the most Mm -hmm. throughout the season so most of those guys on the bench when you when they went in it it wasn't a pretty sight like in the Baylor game right when they had to rely on the guys on the bench they lost control very quickly Mm mm-hmm yeah. So yeah, it's gonna be interesting seeing if Hubert can capitalize off of this. Mm-hmm. And then we have to talk about, I guess, for a minute here that you know Duke moves on without Coach K and how that's gonna look. Yeah. Now that they lost Nolan, breaking news. Yeah. Duke lost Nolan Smith to Louisville, one of the key recruiters and head assistants, mm-hmm. former player for Duke. He goes to Louisville. As yeah. he was being promoted to assistant coach at Duke. Yeah. To coach for Kenny Payne. So he leaves a, home. That's a pretty big pretty big change. Yeah. My cousin has been a Duke fan as long as I've known him, and he's jumping off the ship now. Yeah. Because Kay is gone and Nolan is leaving. He's like, okay, this is a uh, – I don't I don't like what are leaving it all up to John. Yeah. Even with the like top recruiting class coming in, he's like, it doesn't look good to me. Yeah. So that, that's – I think that's the most interesting thing is what Duke's going to do. Um, and who they're going to lose because they're definitely losing Paolo. And I, honestly, I feel like Mark Williams is ready. I think Trevor Keels will probably come back. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, the point guard number three forgot his name. It just, yeah, left my mind, but he showed up big in the tournament. They, they have some good guys, some good experience. I could come back. Yeah. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, but another fun college basketball season coming past and crazy enough we're basically i mean after we get in the nba we're starting to talk about football again (laughs) which just seems ridiculous to me that it goes by that quickly um again we we might have to talk tigers a little bit this season they got they got some stuff going on they got some stuff and opening day is right around the corner young young torkelson yeah, he's 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 looking promising. Yeah, and I've, Tiger, I've seen a few things. The Tigers made a pretty solid trade recently too. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah. Um. But yeah, we'll we'll wait and see. We'll see how the Tigers' season start because they got a very tough se- uh, schedule to start the season. Let's update ourselves on the NBA because we've neglected the NBA for a while with the tournament and all that stuff going on, and there wasn't a whole lot going on. And now we're basically at the end of the season, so there's a lot going on. You know me, and you know where I want to start. But do you want? Do, do we want to start there of who got left out? Because I think that's should a- should we talk about the winners first, or should we save them and just get the losers out of the way? I want. Although get, there's one loser, we we I, have to. I yeah. want to get the loser out of the way. Okay, and, and I want to get the biggest loser out of the way. <laughs> the most embarrassing team in a, in a historic while. franchise history. Mm-hmm. The most disappointing team in LA Lakers history. LeBron is missing out on the playoffs. <laughs> Once again. The Russell Westbrook, LeBron James, injured Anthony Davis. Mm-hmm. Stanley Johnson. Yep. 
I don't even want to go even further because the, the the roster just became depressing. Even though Austin Reeves deserves his credit for giving it everything he yeah. had. The future of the NBA, Taylor Horton Tucker. What a what a what a rough season for yeah. Taylor. What a rough season. For After TSP. they could have traded almost anybody for Taylor Horton Tucker last year, uh, they wanted to make sure they kept him on the roster, and he averaged nine points this year. You, you really you want to talk about? This is one of the few off the last off seasons where I've I've never seen a team make every wrong decision. They literally they didn't get a single roster decision right. Yeah, getting rid of Caruso, KCP, and Kuzma yep. was all wrong. Mm-hmm. Bringing in all those old guys that can't play defense was all wrong. Going, and then you, going for Westbrook over DeRozan, was, and then you top it off with having the option of Buddy Heald first mm-hmm. was on the table. A deal that you were going to make. Yep, you backed out. Apparently, DeRozan was going to be the next option. Mm-hmm. You back out of that. I hear Lakers fans say that they didn't have the money for DeRozan. Uh, what I've heard, and this is through like ESPN and stuff a little bit, is that LeBron started talking to Russ. That also happened. During the negotiations of talking with DeRozan. And I think that was off-putting for DeRozan. Which, I, I mean, I would to be To this too. day, he still says he, he wanted to be a Laker, and he still right. will be. So... Is uh, Le GM uh, maybe to blame a little for this? Hey, uh, Lakers fans are going hardest at Rob Palenka. Of because, course they are. Because apparently you aren't supposed to listen to LeBron James yeah. and what he wants. Right. Uh, apparently <laughs> apparently the, the power struggle yeah. is supposed to be in Rob Palenka's court. Right. But I, I don't know why. they They go one day. LeBron is supposed to be in control and he's the greatest and he's supposed to have all this power. Even with Rob Palenka being the GM, Mm -hmm. everybody knows LeBron is the most powerful person in this organization. Right. Anywhere that he goes. If you don't please LeBron, why are you there? Yeah. Why, why do you have the seat? Which I think made the, the whole rust stuff even more weird because we knew that that wasn't going to work out from the get go. Well, People that people that knew well, basketball knew. Yeah, there were a lot of people that were saying, "Oh, who's gonna beat this lineup? We got three Hall of Famers. This this has to work." The, it all came back to, "Yeah, we have LeBron. He can figure it out. Mm-hmm. Anything is possible with LeBron." And a lot of people are pointing out, you know, LeBron had like one of his best seasons since since he was like twenty. Um and. He did, but it's it's for specific reasons. Right. This wasn't he wasn't supposed to average. 30. I, and I think that's and averaging thirty at thirty seven is incredible. And I think that's part of my problem with, especially the LeBron lovers, is that they try to say like, oh yeah, well he he did everything that he could, and it just wasn't enough. Well, at the same time, like that's that's not what this team is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be LeBron carrying this team, and. That just it doesn't work in the NBA most of the time. Like you can't just single handedly carry a team, and he has to figure out a way to get his team involved more. To figure out if he's the smartest guy in the room, the highest basketball IQ. He's the smartest basketball player in NBA history, in my opinion. Okay, and highest IQ in basketball history. So then, why did he pick Russ? That's that's kind of my argument, and I, I, I understand it. Like, I know that he's a smart player. I'm not denying that. But sometimes there comes a time where it feels like he's trying to be – I don't even I don't even want to put this – it's – this is the only example I have. Bob Quinn, trying to be the smartest man in the room. LeBron is a better man than Bob Quinn. But it felt like LeBron was trying to be the smartest man in the room in that scenario. Well, I'm I'm gonna change my thought a little bit because once once I shrugged my shoulders, I realized there there are there's a difference the way NBA players look at other players and the way we look at NBA mm-hmm. players is completely different. True. All all star players, all high level coaches, all high level people in the NBA have the utmost respect for Russell Westbrook. Yeah. We haven't respected him as a player in years. Mm-hmm. 
Russ fans, OKC fans, and like of and NBA players, NBA players and coaches, they see Russ as the Hall of Famer, the guy that can do anything. Yeah. If we get Russ, and we I, can do anything. The only thing that I ever respect Russell Westbrook for, he's going to give you 110% every night. On offense. That's like, yeah, for the most part. <laughs> but like yeah. he goes at 100 miles per hour all the time. And, and I, his, I, his greatest strength is his greatest weakness. Yes. As we know. Yes. And that's the thing with a guy like LeBron. He's the smartest player in NBA history on the court and off the court in a lot of ways. But the the respect level NBA players have for other greats that are in the league, mm-hmm. that's something we we just won't understand because yeah. we're not in there. When LeBron sees a chance to get Russell Westbrook, a guy that averages triple doubles and was a one-man show, an absolute machine in OKC, mm-hmm. went to Washington, played great point guard, had incredible like numbers of assists and rebounds in Washington last year. LeBron went, we should be unstoppable. Yeah, Buddy Heald, DeMar DeRozan, Russell Westbrook. NBA players are going to look at it that way. And that's where I just don't understand it because... GMs look at fit. Out of everything, LeBron should know that sometimes these power-stacking teams don't always work out. Sometimes you lose to the Mavericks, to the old guys. Um, and when he won in Cleveland, was kind of with the old guys. Now, this Lakers team is somewhat the old guys, but it just wasn't, like, everybody knew it wasn't the right fit. And I don't know. It's, it's, just, it, it's, it's another, di- us fans, we have the luxury to think without, like, emotion we can just think from numbers and like analytics like we we kind of think like robots yeah we well, take all emotions out and we're like obvious terrible fit no get him out of here mm-hmm. and lebron is like hey man this dude is from here he wants to be a laker we all respect the player he is yeah i'm lebron i have a high iq look at the numbers russ has put up he has a high iq too there's there's no way we can't figure this out yeah and then we have Anthony Davis, who's going to be the best player on the team, right? That's why we brought him in. Yeah. So he can take over the the heavy parts that I don't have to do. There's no way this can't work. Yeah. No, he, I get he doesn't, it. He doesn't think in the straight, yeah, the way we think. Although it's it, it it was obvious from the jump. Yeah. It was obvious. And, I mean, there's, there's relationships and stuff that we don't see from player yeah. to player, even though they're on different teams and stuff like that. Um, but, yeah. So the Lakers are out, which is crazy. Thirty-one um, and forty-eight record, terrible. Um, the other one, obviously, more to injury and quickly turning to a rebuild is Portland missing the playoffs. That's been a while since they missed the playoffs. They finished twenty-seven to fifty-two, but we know Dame Lillard's been out for a long time. So then they decided they're going to trade CJ McCollum, and it was all downhill from there. I I just want to, according to Portland, they're not rebuilding. Well, yeah. They're retooling, Joey. We talked about that. You, you got to remember that. They're right. they're going to reform the roster around Dame, and they're going to be better than ever. We'll see. Yeah, they're going to get Nobody some big that. free agent to Portland, right? Nobody's coming to Portland. Kevin Love maybe finally will come to Portland. And his Six final years year. too late. <laughs> yeah. Six, seven years too late. That's right. nice. That's nice. Right. Um, On the Eastern Conference side, another couple surprises. I mean, as the season went on, they weren't that big of a surprise. Indiana. They also decided they're rebuilding, retooling, whatever, yeah. um, trading Sabonis and things, Brogdon not being able to stay healthy. TJ Warren apparently should be ready to go next season. Last time we saw him, he scored 53 in the bubble, mm-hmm. and we haven't seen him uh, since. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah. supposedly he's on the track to uh, be good next year, unfortunately. Um, New York being eliminated, that was rough as well. 35 that, and 44 after after. A- Last yeah. season, having a great season. Another Nick season. Last last year, it really was just an aberration. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it was absolutely fake. I don't know what happened. Maybe it is that Tom Thibodeau just, like, he gets the most out of a team in the first few years. Yeah. And then he just grinds, the like, everything into dirt. Yeah. Everybody's so excited the first year. They buy into this hard-nosed defense, and then they're like, man, this is tiring. <laughs> also, Julius Randle went from their savior to an absolute pariah, and now they hate him. It, yeah. 
is has there been a bigger characters like from hero to villain switch yeah. within a year in the NBA? I That's, don't know if there's been one. Yeah, it's pretty unfortunate that he decided to backlash against the New York crowd, which is never a good idea. <laughs> Why you can't talk yeah. to New York fans, you can't talk to Philly fans, you just especially have, when you're if you're not playing well. Yeah. What what is it what is going to happen? Yes. Yeah. Um the only positive thing I would say for the Knicks is that they got a better season out of RJ Barrett. He, hey, they have a guy to believe in. Yeah, he finally got it going this season. Um, and they got some good young pieces, uh, but, yeah, sad for Knicks fans. Um, let's talk about the people they got in that not necessarily were surprises, but were happy for, I guess. I, I think the Spurs, as the Spurs always do, sneaking into the playoffs, uh, I think would have figured that without DeMar DeRozan, they were done for. Um, but DeJounte Murray stayed healthy this season. He played outstanding all season. Yeah. And, I mean, their record's only 34-45, and 45, but they made the play-in tournament, so technically they're in the playoffs. Yeah, they, they, they got talent, but more than that, they've got a bunch of just scrappy young guys that play just quality team basketball. Mm -hmm. what, what Pop wants, yeah. even though they didn't have an amazing season. So that's fun to see New Orleans getting in. That was a big surprise for me. Um, I thought they were just doomed. And they, Once they made the McCollum trade, what did you think would happen from there? I thought it was going to take them a lot longer to figure it out. Okay. I thought it was a good deal, but I figured it just it, – I just thought that it wasn't going to be that quickly, that they'd be able to integrate him into the lineup. And it's worked out really well, and, you know – there's weird reports that say Zion's going to play this season. I can't imagine him playing this season um, just to play in a play-in game. Um, but, yeah, McCollum's been huge. Uh, Ingram's had a bounce-back season. Valanchunas has been incredible. He's everything that they wanted Steven Adams to be last year. They're um, completely different players, but yeah, yeah Steve, the Steven Adams style didn't fit them. Right. He fits perfectly in Memphis. Jonas fits perfectly. It was a great swap. Yeah. Josh Hart has been great in a lot of scenarios and they're they're getting a lot out of their young guys uh we said it before the show started herb jones has been great he might be the like most underrated rookie of this class yep uh jackson jackson hayes is finally starting to to figure things out a little bit just a little bit um and then they just got they just got guys on the bench that jose alvarado yeah sneaky man on defense mm -hmm. making plays I'm surprised about how much Willie Green has gotten out of the young players. Yeah. Especially the dudes, those guys like Jose Alvarado and Herb Jones. Yep. They weren't like highly touted picks, but they they just play their butts off. Yep. And then we've seen potential from guys like Trey Murphy, uh, Kira Lewis, and things like that. So, you know, there's uh, there's some hope there. Um, But, I mean, I don't see them doing a whole lot playing tournament. Uh, the Clippers – they finished at 39 and 40 again. They've been riddled with injuries and it hasn't mattered. No. But I mean it's mattered enough where they're in the playing tournament. But they haven't had Kawhi or Paul George for Paul George has played 3 games. Yeah. And they had a winning record for most of the season. Yeah. Well, and they like, were able to blow out the Bucks too. That yeah, was What what Ty Lue has done with this team. A few years ago people were saying Ty Lue just wasn't a real coach. Right. He was just there, and like for LeBron, to, me included. Yeah. I'll be honest, and he just got this roster to the playoffs without Kawhi and Paul George. Yeah, I mean, look at this. I mean, granted, this was a game where the Bucks sat all of their players as well, but the Clippers' starting lineup was Robert Covington, Zubac, Terrence Mann, Luke Kennard, Amir Coffey. Coffey had thirty-two. Covington, Covington had forty-three. Forty-three points. Kennard had twenty-three. Um. Yeah. And the crazy thing, too, is, like, Isaiah Hartenstein has been crazy good for them off the bench, um, getting double-doubles and things like that. So, yeah, they're kind of just, like you said, a, a scrappy team that's kind of made their way. And we can't forget your favorite player, Reggie Jackson. Yeah, we can forget about him. The it. Lakers killer. You have to love him. He, used to, he embarrassed, the Lakers, mm. embarrassed the Lakers twice. Anyway. <laughs> and then, of course, the bounce-back season for Minnesota. This is a this is a good one to see. Yeah, I'm really happy for how, the position they're in. Even though they did just lose to the G League Oklahoma City Thunder, uh, but I mean they're 45 and 35. Uh, they're 
most likely going to be in the playing tournament. There's a weird chance that they could make it to the sixth seed, but I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, and yeah, cool for them. The rest of the top of the Western Conference is kind of, you know, what we've been expecting. We've seen all season. Phoenix, Memphis, Golden State. Um, Dallas kind of sneakily been very good, I, I think. I think Dallas can really make a sneaky run. Hmm. Would when we get to playoffs, we'll talk about that, but I I can't believe how well they're playing. Mm-hmm. Especially after that Dinwiddie trade, which we thought was just like who cares? Right. Spencer has been his self again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then towards the end of the season, Phoenix just kind of exploded again and just ran away with everything. They're at 63 and 16. They're going to have a fantastic season. Have we talked about how Utah is just almost done? They're just kind of a meddling team in the middle? I think Donovan Mitchell is the first superstar to leave his team. Like the first young star to leave his team. Out of all the groups next year, I think he's gone. Because I th- I really think he kind of hates Rudy Gobert. Disregarding I th- Ben Simmons. I think he cannot stand Rudy. I saw a stat that he's passed it to him like twice uh-huh. this year. Hmm. <laughs> Weird. He, did, he, he just doesn't like him. And I, I honestly wouldn't like him that much either if he didn't contribute anything on offense and got ripped apart on in the playoffs on defense. I mean, kind of overrated. Yeah, I feel like Utah is kind of turning into kind of what we've seen out of Denver. I know Denver's had some injuries, especially this season. But at the same time of, like, being close so many times and possibly not ever getting over the hump. At least at least they have Jokic. Mm-hmm. They have an all-time great big man. And they've made good enough moves to stay, like, really competitive. Mm-hmm. I think what you the the moves Utah have has done has just I, they're not improving anymore. Like I think Denver could come back strong next season. Yeah. Curious to see. Um, Golden State, of course, they're without uh, Steph Curry, but he should be back for playoffs. Um, so they're gonna be a little bit nervous, maybe because Clay still hasn't like gone crazy i don't think he's had a few really good games in the past yeah. weeks and jordan Poole has been on fire yeah he's really turning into like one of their most underrated picks which is funny because like years. early on in the season he was kind of that guy while clay was hurt and then there was like this weird stuff of like he didn't play very much and apparently like steve kerr and him were not agreeing or something and now he's back to playing well and shooting well. So just kind of a weird thing. Then, of course, um, Memphis, like just an incredible season for this young team. Um, like we said, without John Morant and they're still winning games is crazy and fun to watch. So they will be exciting um, for the playoffs. And then um, moving over to the Eastern Conference, um, the surprise – of Brooklyn being in the play-in tournament, uh, even with their talent, even with Kyrie, you know, sitting so many games and whatnot, I would have expected them to be a little better. Um, but we'll see them in the in the play-in tournament, and it's gonna stink for whoever has to play them first round. Yeah, because I- you got the one or the two seed, and you have to go against Brooklyn. Kind of doesn't seem fair, but. It is what it is. Yeah. And when when KD was hurt, when when you got starting lineups with Kessler Edwards and I, I'm a I'm a Cam Thomas fan, but it's not like he was gonna average like twenty something a game. Mm-hmm. Like uh, what what were they supposed to do with Bruce Brown and Kessler Edwards as their like their main forwards? And I don't think there was many great options. Yeah. And Nick Claxton is a good young big, but he wasn't gonna do a lot for them as a starter. Right. Yeah, so we'll have to wait and see. Um, Charlotte and Atlanta did sneak in. They made it in the play-in. They were on the bubble a lot of the season, um, but they finished pretty strong. I think Charlotte will be pretty interesting. Atlanta's pretty interesting. Um, And then kind of unfortunate for Cleveland to fall out of that top six. Um, So they'll have to be in the play-in tournament. Health problems really 
messed them up yes. with Jared Allen out. Yeah, so that hurt kind of their their good season, along with also the Chicago Bulls. One of the greatest stories, I think, of the season, besides Memphis probably, um, Chicago being one of the top teams in the East for so long in the season, and they just announced that Lonzo Ball is going to be shut down for the remainder of the season. Hmm. Now, they're still a good team without Lonzo. I mean, obviously, they've played without him for a while. Um, but there's the fact that they had, they've had they They've beat a good team, I think, twice this season. Yeah, they're like two and nineteen against good against winning teams. Right, which is very alarming. Yes, yes. So they're at forty five and thirty four, um, and we have the Raptors, who they kind of finished the season strong. They were towards the bottom of the barrel early on in the season. They finished well. They're at forty six and thirty three right now, and I mean, if it wasn't for Cade having such a crazy month last month. Scotty Barnes may have just jumped him in rookie of the year candidacy because he's probably number two for sure because of Mobley being injured and stuff at times, um, not being able to play as much. But yeah. they have gotten so much out of Scotty Barnes. Um, it's also it it I think it needs to be noted that Pascal Siakam looks like he's back to yes what he was when he was an All Star starter two years ago. Yeah, it took him he's a while, been, but he's yeah. he's gotten there. He got his confidence back, and he's been balling. Yep, so him and Van Vliet kind of running the show. Gary Trent as well. He's kind of started a little bit slow, and he's been playing really good lately. And, uh, yeah, so cool to see the Raptors kind of back in form. Uh, Philly sitting at four. One of the favorites to win the whole thing, but we'll have to – we'll see. We need to talk about James. Okay. What do we got to talk about? What do you want to talk about with James? Is he a shell of himself? Is it over for James Harden? I've been... Or is he just hobbled? I've been kind of off the James Harden train for a while, to be honest. Um, but he His first four games with Philly, he he looked incredible. Yeah. It was like 27, like 12 assists, and like seven rebounds a game. Mm-hmm. And since then, he's been honestly terrible. Yeah. Tyrese Maxey has been their second best player because James just – he has no rhythm. Mm-hmm. He, it looks like he can't move how he used to move. His shot isn't falling like it – I just – I don't understand Yeah, what happened. I think that's – I hate to say it, but it's like from what we saw in the NCAA tournament as well – feels to me sometimes like it's this new style of basketball to where teams are shooting so much and it just seems like guys are going in bigger and longer slumps or streaks. Like, I mean, we saw DeRozan go crazy for so many games and now we're seeing guys as well do the opposite where they're just struggling for so many games. So I don't know if it's the way that the game is played right now that there's so many guys that have the green light on anything that they're just never getting into a good rhythm. Um, I'm not sure. That could be a part of it because it is true that in with the game changing, guys are taking more difficult shots mm-hmm. and not searching for easy shots to just get going. But... I think the top scorers in the game, they still don't have a problem. Like Jason Tatum, Devin Booker, they're the guys that know how to get to their spots and know how to get easy buckets, Mm -hmm. even when their three-point shot isn't falling. The guys that are mainly shooters, like James Harden, who's he's constructed his entire game around getting fouled and shooting free throws and step-back threes. Yeah. That's what I was also going to ask. Do you think that it's in part that Harden's not getting to the line as much as he's used to that they kind of changed their rules on him and that that was kind of his way to get into a rhythm and get going. That may be a part of it. A a big part of his big scoring games was shooting free throws. He would hit almost like anywhere from 15 to 20 or over 20 free throws Mm -hmm. in certain games. But it seems like he just, he doesn't play the same. He doesn't move the same. I don't, I don't know. I don't know, mm-hmm. but it's not good. <laughs> right now that they're going into the playoffs, 
and he just doesn't look like himself. Like I, I don't see a way for him to just click it on. Right. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, luckily for him, Joel Embiid has been unstoppable lately. Um, but yeah, they need him to figure it out, or they're just gonna be in the same, same old boat that Philly's always been in, where they just can't, can't break through. Yeah. But all, I think also a weird thing is when he was forcing his way out of Houston, but he was still playing, he was putting up huge numbers. Mm-hmm. His last like few games in Houston, he yeah. was going for forty. He was getting over ten assists. He was still dominating, yeah. But that's when it looked like he was fat and out of shape. But he was still dominating somehow, right? I don't understand why he can't. Like, maybe it's maybe it's injury. I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say. Hard to say. But if they're gonna have to play against, I mean, right now because second, third, and fourth place are forty nine and thirty, so those standings can switch all over the place. But man, could you imagine if Philly has to play Brooklyn in the first round? I would Ooh. love it. I would absolutely. I don't even oh, know if Ben boy. Simmons is going to play at this point. Kevin Durant but might go for 50. He might. Him or Kyrie. Yeah. And Bede might also go for 50, though. Yes. Um, crazy. Um, so the third seed in the East, Milwaukee. Just that they're doing what they always do at this point. Uh, Giannis has been great. Middleton has been great. Um, and then Boston, we've kind of touched on them a little bit, but they – had a great second half to the season. Um, well, honestly, one of the best, one of the best turnarounds I've seen in a long time. Mm-hmm. From a, it looked like they didn't have many answers, yep. and Ime Udoka couldn't figure things out, and their rotations weren't that great. Now all of a sudden, they're the best defensive team in the league. Yeah, Jason Tatum has hit his MVP ceiling. He's starting to hit it. Mm-hmm. Jalen Brown is still balling. Marcus Smart is playing some of the best basketball of his career. On both sides. And they're getting a lot out of their bench. But then there's a little hang-up. Things are going great, and then you lose Time Lord. <laughs> Robert Williams tore his, was it was his meniscus? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, and nobody knows when he'll be back. Mm-hmm. If it'll be soon or he's out for the season. Yeah. And he's become a huge part of what they do on defense and offense. Yeah. Now, luckily, they do have Al Horford. But obviously, Al Horford is not the defensive player that, you know, Robert Williams is. Now, Horford can get – he's a good shot blocker, but um, moving his feet defensively he's not as good at. But he is a good playmaker for this team, so at least they have, you know, a veteran guy. And then, of course, they got uh, Tice back in the trade uh, during the season, so they got some guys there. But, yes, Robert Williams, kind of a big loss for them. And then, uh, it, to me, it's been a surprise. Um Miami sitting up at the top in the East um, because they've gone through so many weird stretches of like Tyler Hero looking awful and then Tyler Hero finally becoming Tyler Hero again. Jimmy Butler and Udonis Haslam getting into arguments on the side of the because, bench. Because it's them two, that's honestly nothing. No, it, I, I never it blew thought up it was. in the moment, but yeah. Yeah, I never really thought much of it, but at the same time, it's just, I don't know. This Miami team, like Bam Adebayo was struggling a lot. Um, Duncan Robinson still has never, ever since he got paid, Yeah, his jumper hasn't been what it was. Yeah, he had a good, he's had a couple good games uh, recently. Yeah, And now they're trying to like weirdly put like fit Oladipo back in as like a six man. I mean, he scored 21 though against Toronto the other night. It, it's one game. I'm not going to get I know. super encouraged. I know, but, but like, it's nice that he can still score in the 20s. I was going to say though, like you look at their lineup right now, their lineup is weird. Um, they got Lowry, Jimmy Butler, Bam, and then they're kind of like rotating guys like Markeith Morris and Max Struess and stuff. But like having Hero, Oladipo, and Duncan possibly coming off your bench. On, on paper, that sounds incredible. Very scary. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. They're kind of a weird team. Um, but they can get it done, and they could be tough because they're deep. Gabe yeah. Vincent's had some good games here and there. Max Struess has been one of their best shooters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I honestly think Tyler Hero is going to be their big X factor in the playoffs. Yeah, because he has had an incredible third season. Mm-hmm. He's probably going to be six man of the year, 
and he just came off a career high 35. Mm -hmm. So he's really just rolling. Nobody can really guard him right now, and his confidence is through the roof. Can he continue it through the playoffs like he did in the bubble his rookie year? That's the question. Or will he go back to his sophomore slump? I'm thinking he continues it. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be cool to see. Um, But, yeah, I think the East is kind of kind of wide open. Um, and then of course we got the Pistons down in the bottom, hopefully doing, locking in, doing, doing the best job they can. They're real showing close. promise and still losing real close to locking in a top four, um, spot. They want to be top three because the top three are the same odds for getting the number one overall pick. And they are a 50% chance, I believe to get the top four, um, which is what we want. We want the highest possible odds. Um, and they're doing it just like we want. We're seeing great, honestly, great production out of Isaiah Livers. Um, like, I, I don't know. Pistons are looking really good. Sadiq Bay has been crazy in a couple games here and there. Whenever Cade is out, he just lights up. Yeah. At Indiana, he had 30. He had 20 in the first half and finished with 31 in a win. And Indiana. they're giving Killian Hayes 25 shots, which is crazy. This is exactly what needs to happen. I'm so happy people are doing things that make sense. <laughs> giving Killian Hayes more confidence and making him be aggressive. That is exactly what needed to happen. Mm-hmm. 26, 7, and 6 at OKC. And I think he had like five steals too. Mm-hmm. First Pistons player to have the stat line like that since Grant Hill in the 90s, yeah. which is incredible. Mm-hmm. And then the next game, I think he had like 12 or 13 points. He's gaining confidence. Yeah, His jumper's looking good. He's making more moves. And he's looking like he could be a really good backup for the future. So it might not be a wasted pick. Yeah. I'm, I'm still skeptical. I'm debating whether to... Oh, yeah, I'm not all in. I'm, whether, I'm deciding whether I want to use this rise as trade or maybe try to hold on and see if he can actually develop um but either way it's it's good and i don't remember if we mentioned it last week that carson edwards signed to a two-year deal for the pistons which i think is like a sneaky good play and yeah um, th- i think he had 13 in his first game mm-hmm. yeah and he's been pretty good um with assists and things like that uh yeah maybe we did because i think i think like my biggest concern is that it pushes Saban lee back again which is unfortunate. I, I think they play different styles. Yeah. He's he's much more of a shooting guard. Right. Than a point guard. Saban is a real point guard. Yeah. So we'll we'll have to see. But um again, Pistons looking good. Actually, let's while we while we're on the topic, because we've pretty much gone over the recap um for the most part. Now that the tournament is over and we've seen those top four guys of Chet, Paolo, Jabari, and uh, Jay Nivey. Who do you want the Pistons to get? You're saying if we have the number one pick? Yes. If we have the option to choose any of those guys, which out of the four do you want? If we have the number one pick, after this tournament, it's looking like everybody is back on the Paolo Bancaro train. And he is the most physically talented of the bunch. He has everything you'd want to start mm-hmm. with the top pick. But I'm sticking to Jabari Smith. Mm. And that is because him being 6'10", him having some ability to get a rebound and handle a little, and not just being a rebound handed off to the guard, get to my spot shoot. I think he's the best shooter in the draft at 6'10", at 18 years old. Mm. He was consistent for most of the season where Paolo would have like two to three games of a dominant stretch and then he would fade away into the background for four to five games. I don't know what it is with Paolo when it comes to that. He had a great tournament stretch and he played his best in the biggest moments. Mm Mm-hmm. But that's still weird to me that he would just fade away at moments. Yeah. I think Jabari's locked in all the time. I think he's motivated. Him being 6'10 with that jumper 
and he's already a good defender. I think it's going to be a while before Paolo is a really good defender. I would go Jabari Smith. Before the tournament, I was starting to buy in, maybe not at, at one overall, but I was really starting to buy into the idea of Jaden Ivey. After the tournament, for me, that ship has kind of sailed. Um, I don't think that it's like a talent standpoint, but like if we're four, I want Jaden Ivey. But at the same time, I'm a little more hesitant on that pick than I was previously, I guess. And that's unfortunate just because he kind of had a, a rough tournament or a rough end to a tournament. Um, but I think still, like, as much as people have fallen off the Chet bandwagon, I just, I feel like the potential is just too high that I, I can't pass that kind of thing up. I don't blame you. And I agree with your statements, like, about Jabari and things, but I just think Chet could become the same thing somewhat in, in a somewhat vein, like a good shooter, a good all-around player. He's already a good that's, shooter. He could get better. That's a few more inches taller than Jabari. He's um, a few inches taller. He has real guard skills. Mm -hmm. He's a menace on defense in the paint. And the thing that's the best with him is he's super skinny, but he doesn't care. Right. He does not care. And right he's going to keep going mm -hmm. and keep playing. He's never going to back down. Nobody's ever going to – he's going to – he'll probably get dunked on some. He'll probably get bullied sometimes. But while he's getting stronger and improving, in the beginning, he won't give up in the beginning even when he's getting pushed around. Yeah. He's going to keep going. And I think, like, I start thinking towards fit, and I feel like he kind of covers Marvin Bagley – and Isaiah Stewart's weaknesses that like Bagley could stay more towards post up pick and roll. Now Chet can do those too, but he can also like flash to the corners a little yeah. bit better. That would, that would, that would be mo much more comfortable for, ba for Bagley. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like if you play him alongside with beef stew, like obviously Isaiah can be more of that big powerhouse that we just know him to be. And, Again, like Chet can spread the floor. So it seemed like, and then you have two good defenders where, you know, on the defensive side, Chet would cover for Bagley. So I just feel like as a fit, like he could pair with kind of either one of those guys and play alongside them. Now here, here's my thing with that. I think he would, I think he would fit with either one, either one of them. But here's the thing. He has to fit next to one of them. Yeah. So does I wouldn't mind Isaiah Stewart being the backup center. Oh, and I, being an incredibly gritty, high level backup center. That's I. That's exactly where I'd put him. I wouldn't keep him in the starting lineup. I'm just saying, as a rotation goes, you could bring in Isaiah Stewart for Bagley or something, and then still keep Chet in. Um, I just think it gives you a few more options. Um, but yeah, I I don't see Isaiah Stewart being a starter for this team. Even like almost no matter who they draft, yeah. Unless it's Ivy. Pistons fans, they're pe people are trying to go after DeAndre and Pistons fans want him in free agency so bad. I just can't so, see that happening. Yeah. But if it did, I mean, it, it'd be incredible. But it is, it's the point showing that they they want a higher level center, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, outside of those top four, like if the Pistons got super unlucky and they had to be, they were fifth. Let's just do fifth. Who do you want outside of those top four guys? I have no idea. No idea. I literally, I, I, I am only, I am singularly focused on this top four because I don't see them dropping out of it anyway. Yeah. I, I'm focused on the top four and what they can each do because they could all fit and they all have different talents that could all be very good. Mm -hmm. I, I really, I do not know. What, I, I wouldn't know who to take at five. Like, I just lean towards. I, I wouldn't go um, Jalen Duran. I wouldn't go Jalen Duran. I wouldn't go one of the G League guys. Like I love, I love Jaden Hardy's scoring scoring ability. Jaden Hardy's scoring ability, but he's still he's he's not very efficient yet, and it, it wouldn't be very pretty in the beginning. And Keegan Murray, even though he has the ability, Keegan, Keegan Murray, Murray you, you can't take Keegan Murray that high. He didn't man. look. He just didn't look. 
He didn't look like a high level, aggressive. high impact. He yeah. just doesn't look aggressive enough. I think that was my biggest problem with Keegan Murray. Yeah. Um, I like his game. I think he would fit, but he seems so nonchalant in a tournament game. Like that's a problem. Um, I think that's why I would actually lean towards Jalen Duran. Actually, I I don't think I would not. <laughs> Again, I wouldn't like it. I, I think there's a huge gap here, uh, obviously between the top four and the next guys. But again, I think I would just go towards the potential and upside. And he's he's got that NBA body already. That I think that's where I'm going. But I'm I'm in total agreement with you. I do not want to get into that scenario. I'm going to a mock draft right now just to see the guys with the other options. The last one I saw so, had Keegan Murray at five. That's absurd. A yeah. lot of people because I saw like Keegan Murray, uh, Jalen Duran. Ben Matherin. Ben Matherin is an option. I'm I'm upset that I forgot about See, ben I'm Matherin. I'm not as on board. I don't know. I, I think know. his potential is really high. But people are getting really high on AJ Griffin from Duke. Ugh, Two I, guard. I don't like AJ That was a streaky shooter but ended with a high percentage. He showed some ability to put the ball on the floor. Yeah. He's 6'7" 200. He's built and he's athletic. But there's a lot more to come with his game. He has some defensive ability, too. Mm-hmm. You said you're not in on him. No. Shadon Sharp, the Kentucky guard that never played at Kentucky. Nice. He looks like an absolute beast of a young player, mm-hmm. but we don't know. There's literally nothing but question marks about Shadon Sharp. Johnny Davis, I'm not in on Johnny Davis. I'm just not. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not in on his potential. Jeremy Sohan, I think he... I think he would be a better like late first round pick, even though he might not make it out of the lottery. Mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of of Jeremy Sohan from Baylor. He's almost six ten. He can shoot it. He can put it on the floor. He has overall skill mm-hmm. at his size. He's not he's not like close to what Paolo has talent wise and physical, but he has a lot of talent, and he has good size. Mm. Yeah, and that yeah, I mean it's, that it's, tells you it's, that a, it's a complete. The draft is very top loaded. Um, after that, it's gonna be could be rough. Um, there's there's Malachi Branham from Ohio State. He could become a good scorer, but I I would I wouldn't want him at five. Yeah, like is that five pick? I don't know who who's I don't know who's gonna be. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. A team know. might just take a swing. Right. Yeah, that's tough. But that's why the Pistons need to be. They, they need that top four. And they need the we top four. We have full belief in them getting that top four. Yeah, I mean, the, I'm the, not afraid at all. The odds are really low. Um, but we'll we'll see. We'll have to wait and see. Um, we won't get into draft talk today. That's yeah, we don't have time. Um, so we'll have to talk about draft stuff probably next week. Um, get going on that. We will probably talk about the NBA one more time as we get into playoffs. We can preview playoffs because I believe by next week all the games will be played. Yeah, college basketball's over, so yeah, it'll be NBA and NFL draft talk. So we'll do some uh, previews for the NBA playoffs most likely. We'll start talking about the NFL draft. Um, Should we sneak in some baseball? Opening yeah. day coming up. That's why I said we might be able yeah. to sneak in some baseball because I think, I think for once the Tigers are going to actually be interesting. Um, it's been a little while. They've made some moves. Um, and there's some spotlights and some show that they are trying to go back all in. And so they're in a similar spot to, like we said, the Pistons are where they're right around turning the corner. Um, they might be just a little bit ahead of the Pistons. And then, um, I mean, the Lions are probably another year away, but Detroit sports, we might be back. There's some positivity. Um, but yeah, we will talk about that next week. This has been Views from the Sidelines. We'll see you guys next time. The Pistons land outside of the top four. You know what? Screw it. Let's take Caleb Houston. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no Michigan players top top ten, not top twenty. If Musa comes out, maybe first round. I don't know. I don't know. No Michigan players. We got top four.